Well, hello there. Welcome to the Abbotsford Seventh-day Adventist Church for our online church service this morning. Well, how are things going with you with all the challenges in our life nowadays? You know, we just get used to one thing and trying to make adjustments, and then it seems like there's something else to deal with. You certainly, we haven't gotten much relaxation or rest by looking at uh, the television set and hearing and watching the news. And you know, um, I ran into a uh, book that, uh, a, little, a very small little book by Ruth, Ruthie Jacobson that I would like to just share a couple things with you that might uh, give us, give you, give me some ideas as to how to deal with the storm that we are dealing with. In fact, it's called Five Secrets for Peace in the Storm. And you know, uh, we, we can't start and we can't solve the whole thing. We, we're just so small and we're so insignificant compared to the huge crowds that we see on our television sets. But we can do some things ourselves to, uh, to make it better. So let me just share those five little secrets that, Jay, that Ruthie gives in this little book that might give you some ideas. The first one is to watch your words, both your words and the words of others. And she makes that interesting point that, uh, that our brains uh, pick up and uh, they listen to what our, word, uh, what our lips say. And so sometimes what we actually say sticks with us and it alters the way that we, uh, we behave and we act. So her first secret is to watch our words. And then she goes to the second secret and she suggests to constantly focus on what you have and not what you don't have. And uh, she also makes a little observation that it's not uh, in serene times, we don't, really, we don't really grow. It's when we have a storm and when we're dealing with it in a good way is when we actually have growth. And so that's another uh, good secret. A third one is to be resourceful and persistent about finding ways to help others. And, uh, you know, you stop and think about it. it. When you're always focused on ourselves, when we're always focused on ourselves, we just aren't, aren't reaching out. We aren't getting out of our own comfort zone. So we really aren't being that much benefit to, to the world or to the, the whole situation. So that's the third little secret she gives. And then, then the fourth one is take care that only healthy, positive influences are allowed in your mind. She talks about how powerful our thoughts are and how they affect uh, how we behave and what we do. And then the fifth one that she gives is to always remember that you are one of God's children. And when you realize that that you are loved, that I am loved by a very loving Heavenly Father, then we do have uh, comfort and, and strength and encouragement to get us through the storm. Now, I just want, might make a suggestion to you that Ruthie Jacobson, you can go if you'd like to hear, this, this lady is a real prayer warrior. She's been involved for many years in prayer ministry. She worked in the North American Division for some time, and um, she's a, really a, pr a real prayer warrior. And if you'd like to go and listen to her talk for a few minutes and just, just be encouraged and blessed by, by Ruthie's ministry, go to YouTube and, um, and type in the word Ruthie Jacobson, and uh, then it's prayer insights. So Ruthie Jacobson, and prayer insights. And uh, it's about 15 minutes long, something like that, but it's very encouraging. And uh, she's such a, uh, such a caring, 
a real uh, child of God that uh, just loves our Lord and is just so encouraging to listen and watch her, watch her speak to us. So we're glad that you're here today and um, we know that you'll be blessed by this service. And uh, you know, the songs, the, the prayers, and just um, we, we trust that this will be refreshing during this time of, of real stress that we're all facing. We're so glad you could join us for our church service here today. I hope that you will join with us as we sing Amazing Grace.
The offering today is for a local church budget. And uh, you know, as you, as, if you could be at the church actually right now, you would see uh, a lot of things that have happened at the church. Uh, the plants that, uh, and the landscaping that has been done look so nice this time of year. And downstairs, there's work that's been uh, done in the kitchen uh, on, the, on the floor, new flooring is being put in, and cabinets are being, uh, are being painted. And, uh, it's, you know, I talked to the treasurer this week, uh, Lawrence Brock, and said, you know, what, what, what should I focus on this, uh, this week for the <clears throat> local budget? And he, one thing he pointed out and said, you know, the added expenses that we are having to, uh, to video our services and, and all of this and the equipment that we need to, uh, to get to, to do this is not covered by our budget. 
And so that's just one suggestion he made to me, and I thought I'd pass it on to you that, that um, it is something that is not in the budget, and it, it is more than, than we've dealt with before because of the unique circumstance. So as you're uh, making out your um, thinking about your offering for this week, we just pray that, uh, that uh, you will look at uh, everything that you would like to give toward. And uh, there are several ways that you can do that. Since you're not here in our, in our sanctuary, you can either go online and make, and you know, you, uh, give your offering there. You can send a check. There is a, a drop box uh, outside on the pastor's door. Or if need be, somebody, uh, one of the elders would be happy to come by and, and, uh, and pick up your, off to your tithe and offerings if that's the way that you, that you would need to from your situation and your circumstances. So let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering today. Kind Father in heaven, we we thank you for being such a loving heavenly father and to us and, and, and the caring way that you deal with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for the, the beauties around us. Thank you for our church, our church family and the efforts being made to, to connect with everybody during these hard times, these challenging times. We pray that you will bless this offering in a special way whether it's for local, the local offering or for the conference or for the, the world. There are so many needs around, and we just know that your blessing will make things go around a lot more. A lot more can be done with your, with your added blessing. So again, we thank you so much, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Our opening hymn this morning is number 44, Morning Has Broken, number 44. and girls. I hope you're having a good Sabbath. I'm having a good Sabbath today. You know what? My little one just turned 18 years old. Can you believe that? And so I decided to go through the toys and things that they won't use anymore. And uh, as I was looking through the toys and 
things that I will donate and stuff like that, I found this doll. And uh, a story came to my mind um, that I remember, and I want to share that story with you today. There were two friends, two little girls, Cindy and Sophie. And they were so close to each other. They were about eight years old. They went to school together. They live in the same neighborhood. And their parents trust each other very much. So sometimes they run errands with each other's parents and stuff like that. And so one day, Cindy uh, shared with Sophie, Oh, Sophie, I want to show you my new doll. And it was, I love it. It's so soft and it has so much hair and it has shoes. And actually, I can change her clothes because it comes from uh, two sets of clothing. And so she was so happy. And so Sophie was like, Oh, I want to see it too, but I need to go to the town with my mom to the supermarket. And uh, do you want to come with us so I can see your doll? And uh, Cindy said, of course, let me ask my mom. And so her mom said yes. And so Cindy and Sophie jumped in the car with Sophie's mom and went to town. That day was particularly hot and muggy because it rained a lot. And so they had their windows down and the mom had to get into the house of one of the neighbors just quickly to drop some stuff. And so the girls spend the whole morning together. And you know, sometimes when you spend a lot of time with even a sibling or a friend, you kind of get tired, you know? And so they were like, you move over there. You're squeezing me. Are you squeezing me? And that's my, that's my water. No, you drink my water. You know, they started to kind of fight with each other. And so Sophie said to Cindy, can I see your doll? But then Cindy felt like Sophie wasn't very nice before. And she said, no, I don't want you to touch my doll. And so Sophie was a little rude and she grabbed the doll and she said, I want to touch it. And Cindy said, please give it back to me. And so they were fighting with the doll. And by accident, Sophie took the doll and the doll just went through the window of the car. And the mom saw that through the mirror and uh, stopped the car. And then Sophie felt so bad. She was like, oh, I didn't intend on that to happen. And so the mom got out of the car and checked for the doll. But the doll was so full of mud and a car had driven on top of it. So it's kind of squish. And Sophie felt so bad. And Cindy, how do you think that Cindy felt? She was so mad and so sad. And she was like, I don't want to be your friend anymore. How could you have done that to my doll? That was my brand new doll. And so they got home. And uh, Sophie didn't know what to say. And Sophie's mom talked to Cindy's mom and really apologized for what happened. So that night, Sophie, after the devotional, before going to bed, she talked to her mom. I said, Mom, what can I do? I didn't want to do that. She said, you know what, Sophie, sometimes we do things to people that we love that hurt. And in the Bible, God has a lot of ideas and he teaches us. What to do when we hurt someone we love or we hurt someone in general? And he talks about forgiveness. And actually, he models forgiveness. He's the first one to forgive us. And so if you're really, really sorry about what you did to, soft, to Cindy, you should apologize. So let's pray about it. So Sophie and her mom pray that night that God will give her the words to ask Cindy for forgiveness and that God will give Cindy a heart of forgiveness. So the next day, Sophie went to Cindy's house and she had a basket with her and she had something in the basket. So she knocked at the door. Do you think she was nervous? Oh yeah, she was nervous because she didn't know if Cindy will say, okay, I forgive you. Okay. 
So she went and knocked at the door and said to the mom, can I talk to Cindy, please? And she said, of course. So she saw Cindy and said, Cindy, I miss you so much. I miss playing with you. And I am so sorry for what I have done. I never wanted to break your doll. And so Cindy, who had already prayed with her mom as well, said, okay, I forgive you. I'm very sad still, but I forgive you. And so Sophie said, to show you that I'm really, really, really sorry and that I really, really would like your forgiveness, I brought this to you. And so she gave it to Cindy and Cindy opened it. And she saw this beautiful doll that was Sophie's favorite doll. They had like hair that it wasn't real, but it was like wig hair, very good quality of her. And he had eyelashes on her face and her hands and her legs and her feet. They were made of porcelain. Beautiful doll. She said, I want you to have it. She said, oh, you cannot do that. I said, yes, I want you to know that I really want your forgiveness and I'm really sorry for what I have done. And so they hug each other and Cindy said, I forgive you. And so boys and girls, whenever we're in a relationship, whenever we have friends or people we love, we will do eventually something that will hurt them because of the sin that is in the world. But again, you always go back to the Bible, which is the recipe book for life. And in the Bible, you will find the answers and you will find the way to repent and the way to ask for forgiveness. I hope you like this story today and you learned something from it. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you forgive us we thank you so much for friends. We thank you so much for relationships. And we just pray, Lord, that if we, in our hearts we have something that we need to ask for forgiveness or that we need to forgive, that we will be able to do that. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Today's scripture reading will be from Luke chapter 21, verses 7 to 11, and I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will all these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you do not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another Sabbath day and carrying us through the week. Lord, we thank you that you are always with us and taking care of us, even though it may not always feel that way. Lord, there's been so many events in the news. There's a world in crisis, and there's so much anxiety and fear. And Lord, I just pray that, that your Holy Spirit will abound much more seeing where all this rioting and, and sin is occurring. The world is groaning, Lord, and they, we all need your blessing and your spirit to guide us through. Lord, we ask that um, you help each one of us here in our church, in our church community, to draw together, even though we may be physically apart, that in spirit we may still be united, and that we may help one another and be helpful in this community in whatever way possible to bring healing. And finally, Lord, I pray that you be with each one of us, that whatever challenges that we're facing, whether it be uh, our jobs or our relational issues or finances or health issues, whatever our issues may be, Lord, I pray that we continue to look to you and trust in your saving grace and your sacrifice for us, that you have defeated the enemy and that we have victory in Jesus and that we can claim this wonderful gift and this good news. And Lord, we pray that our pastor today will be blessed with your Holy Spirit as he brings the message uh, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've probably had somebody come up to you and say, this coronavirus, these riots, all these other things that are happening right now, does the Bible say anything about this? Does this mean Jesus is coming again? Does this mean that these are signs of the times predicted in the Bible? I would have to say that normally I wouldn't be interested in talking about this. In fact, in all my years of ministry, I've never once given a sermon on the signs of the times. I've kind of steered away from Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13. I just, I was never really comfortable with what was said. But I must say that right now, I'm looking at what's happening. And I'm beginning to believe that the collapse of our society as it is today is coming. I don't know when, but it is coming. So I want you to take a look at this scripture here. That's coming up. When you see here, there's, there's pictures. You can see right there, you can see the Australia, an entire continent seemingly on fire from the forest fires. And then you have the famines that seem to continually go, never be with us. And I, they, they will not go away. And then you can see the riots we're having recently. It seems to me that something is going on. When we think about collapse, I think about the book, uh, uh, about uh, collapse, um, about Easter Island. It's an, it's an island, uh, uh, 
I think Jared Diamond is the one that wrote the book. It's an island over in the Pacific Ocean, the Southern Pacific, uh, where a community that once thrived on that island had 10 to 20,000 people reduced itself down to about 600 over time. What happened to the island? Was archaeologists took a look at the island, they found pollen from must have been thousands of trees. And at one time, the, the, the tree was covered, the island was covered with trees. And there's a large population. And that population, what they would do is they would chop the trees down and they would use them for constructing um, ramps and other things to move stone. And they would make these stone um, uh, monuments, and they are massive, and if you took a look at them, you'd stand by them, they're 30 feet high. But time went by, time went by, and the stone structures filled the island, but the trees no longer filled it. Someday, sometime, the last tree was cut down, or something happened to the trees, and the people there no longer flourished. There's five factors to a collapse that we've learned uh, from uh, Jared Diamond's book. Number one is environmental damage. Number two is climate change. Three is war. The next one is, um, you know, the loss of allies. And finally is the way you respond to these challenges is what determines whether or not your society collapses. Well, what happened to Easter Island? Well, and Captain Cook went there in 1774. They had been there about eight centuries at that time. And he found the population had been reduced down to 600 men and only 30 women. Now, why the disparity between men and women? We don't know what was going on there. But the population had reduced dramatically. The statues that had been put so much effort into putting up and erecting, many of them were toppled over. And the inhabitants were, um, uh, they were living on a subsistence diet of just whatever they could find. And uh, they were not a thriving people at all. The society had collapsed. Well, you know, how did that happen? How do things like that happen? And do they happen overnight? No, they happen gradually. It's just a simple, slow process that you can't think about. You know, you, you wonder. You know, you start out with thousands of trees, and then you end up with none. I remember I was having a little fun with my sons, and I was telling them, I said, boys, I said, you better find a wife while you still have hair on your head. And uh, my wife, Linda, did not like that comment, so she looked at me. She says, you've been losing your hair, too. Now, I've always been proud of my full head of hair, and I got really kind of worried. Then I started looking in the mirror and looking to see, and, and then I went and looked at the, this is a picture of us when we were dating, and I started examining it to see if I lost any hair. And, and uh, you know, you can't just tell day by day if you're losing hair, or you can't tell by day by day if you're losing trees in the forest. It all happens very gradually. It's imperceptible changes that happen. Today I want to look at Luke chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. And in these texts, again, something I've always shied away from because I always was just uncomfortable the way, they've, the way that maybe they've been taught or I just didn't like it. I want to look at Luke chapter 21, looking at verse 10 and 11. You'll find this also the same scriptures in Matthew 24 and Mark chapter 13. Jesus is telling the story here about, the disciples ask the question, uh, when will be the destruction of Jerusalem and when will you be your coming? And they just assumed they were, were the same. And so Jesus starts describing it to them. And I'm going to just start with uh, verse 7. So they asked him saying, teacher, and when will these things be? And what will be the sign? Uh, what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is drawn near. 
Therefore, do not go after them. But here's the text we're going to focus on, starting with verse 9. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Do you notice those texts there? It almost perfectly fulfills what Jared Diamond observes in the collapsing of societies. He already mentions wars. But then he mentions kingdoms against kingdoms, which seems to fit the picture of how you got war, but you also you have the, the reduction of relationships and allies between kingdoms. And so we find that, and we wonder, how does that apply to today? Well, take a look at verse, uh, notice there, after that, verse 20, 12 to 24, is the description of the fall of Jerusalem. And I, when I used to look at this, I used to think to myself, well, this is a description. The first part we just read was a description of things that happened before the fall of Jerusalem. They don't apply after the fall of Jerusalem. And I got that by reading Matthew 24 and, and Mark 13. But then I, I, I began to realize, I, I may not be reading this right because Luke 21 says something very different. I'm going to read it for you right now. Luke 21, look at verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and perse persecute you. The, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution of God's people. But he says before all these things, he's talking about the wars and the kingdoms against kingdoms. And he's talking about the famines and the other things mentioned in that list. Those things happen after destruction of Jerusalem, and the persecution of God's people, there seems to be a ramping up of that in the final days. And we see that in Luke chapter 21, verse 12. When you look at this, you see there's the signs of times. War, famine, pestilence, fearful sights, and signs in the heavens. And normally when we look at these things, we would, we would point out, you know, look at, look at how the world is. Jesus is coming soon. And I'd rather not say that right now. In fact, I'd rather let somebody else say it for me. And so here what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at what some pretty famous people are saying about life here on this planet and how long it'll last. Elon Musk. Elon Musk is, is famous for the Tesla, and he's really famous right now for the first commercial non-governmental flight into space that brought humans in, up into space. Just happened last Saturday. He's, been, he's also famous for the Tesla, um, electric cars, and um, Sun City, and all these other things he's doing. He's doing amazing things. And it, but the space rocket, the reason why he was interested in the space rocket program is because he, he wants to someday humans occupy Mars. And that's a driving force. And here is why he wants to do that. Notice what he says here. It's important to get a self-sustaining base on Mars because it's far enough uh, away from the Earth that if the event of, uh, in, in, in the event of a war, it's more likely to survive than a moon base. That's his goal. That's his reason and purpose of life, is to have life, human life, on Mars. That's his clear stated goal. How about another one? Well, remember talked about famine? There are people so concerned about the crops of this world and them, the blight reaching out and destroying the major crops of this world that there is a vault up in an island in northern Norway as far north as you can go and still have a, a, a commercial flight go to it. It's called Svalbard, 
a global seed vault. And what it is, it's keeping the seeds throughout the world in this vault. They keep it at minus 18 degrees Celsius in case something ever destroys the seeds of this world. Famine can be prevented. Another surprising person in this whole the world is coming to an end is Stephen Hawking. Take a look at this statement from him. With climate change, overdue asteroid strikes, epidemics, population growth, our own planet is increasingly perilous. Although the chance, although the chance of disaster to planet Earth in a given year may be quite low, it adds up over time and becomes a near certainty in the next thousand or 10,000 years, Hawking told C in an interview at the time. By that time, we should have spread out into space and to other stars. So disaster on Earth would not mean the end of the human race, he added. However, we will not establish self-sustaining colonies in space for at least the next 100 years. So we have to be very careful in this period. He's saying the planet is going to be destroyed and we need to move to another planet, but we just need to be careful in the meantime. Well, pestilence. Pestilence is another one. We've been experiencing a pestilence in this coronavirus. We know what a pestilence is, but there's more than this. We think coronavirus is bad, and it has been bad. It's clearly worse than the flu, and it has been uh, wreaking havoc throughout the world. But there's another one coming. If you take a look at the way we produce our meat and dairy products, in what is known as intensive factory farming, where the animals are all closed up in cages, pressed together, we we'll find that that's a dangerous practice too. And they are what you call potential virus breeding farms. Dr. Michael Greger, speaking about this, wrote a book on this subject years ago, Bird Flu, a virus, um, of, our, uh, a, a virus of our own hatching. This is what he said about it. When we overcrowd animals by the thousands in cramped football field-sized sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout, there's stress crippling their immune systems. There's ammonia from the de decomposing waste burning their lungs, and there's a lack of fresh air and sunlight. Put all these factors together, and you have a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of disease. He goes on, to make matters worse, selection for specific genes in farmed animals for desirable traits like large-breasted uh, chickens has made these animals almost genetically identical. That means that a virus can easily spread from animal to animal without encountering any genetic variants that might stop it in its tracks. As it rips through a flock or herd, the virus can grow even more vir virulent. And this is what he, he concludes with. If you actually want to create global pandemics, then build factory farms people will ask the question whether or not the sin in humankind affects the world. Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 19 to 21 does give us a picture. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the, the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who is subjected in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, this is talking about humankind. But think about what sin has done to this world and how that's affected us so much. And now we see that sin has affected the world. And the Bible gives us that picture. Take a look at our next text here. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. It says here about Jesus, and that you should reward your servants, the pro this prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. 
Again, the Bible is focusing on people. But you can't help but think that also, when it says destroy the earth, it's talking to those of us who are approaching the earth without much care. Now take a look at this statement. What is the Christian world doing about this? What is their concern? Take a look at this one um, senator. He says, as a Christian, I believe that there is a creator in God who is much bigger than us. Representative Tim Wahlberg, he's a representative, not a senator, told constituents last week in a town hall in Coldwater, Michigan. And I am confident that if there's a real problem, he can take care of it. He has washed his hands. And he's saying, well, God will take care of it. I really don't have to worry about it. Well, what should we do? What is our response? As Seventh-day Adventists, as Bible-believing Christians, what should be our response to global war, war, global pandemics, and global warming? Do we have a responsibility? Or do we simply need to wait until Jesus comes and he will make it all right again? Well, I like this one, uh, this statement from Ignatius of Loyola. Loyola. Act as if everything depended on you. Trust as if everything depended on God. I believe, if we take a look at the scriptures, that we do have a purpose as Christians, and that is to reverse the curse. We should reverse the curse. What is the curse? Well, if you look back in the, in the, in, in the book of Genesis, the curse was that life would become difficult to bring food to the ground, from the ground. Pain and suffering would spread. That is the curse of sin. That is the natural result of sin. And our job is to reverse the curse. One way of doing that is going back to Eden. Going back to the original plan that God had. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. What was the original diet? Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Is that good for you? Can you survive? Can you live on that? I remember um, we were having a, uh, um, a health clinic at uh, a church I was pastoring. And uh, we had a program there, and this one, it was a stop smoking clinic. And this lady came to the stop smoking clinic, and we were promoting a vegetarian diet to help you overcome your, stop, your smoking. And she asked my wife, she says, I, I understand that vegetarian diet stunts the growth of your children. Just at that time, our six foot son showed up and smiled and he was about 15 at the time and she looked up at him and my wife says he's been a vegetarian all his life and uh, she says oh in fact the plant-based diet based on genesis chapter one does several things it re reduces carbon emissions it reduces the chance of viruses multiplying. We've already talked about that. It extends your life. It reduces water consumption. There are all of these advantages that we can have. Now take a look at this next slide. Longevity. In an attempt to reverse engineer longevity, Dan Butner has spent years researching the parts of the world where people live much longer than average. Most of those locations are outside the United States, including Sardinia, Italy, and Okinawa, Japan. But there is one long-living group stateside. It's the Seventh-day Adventists, who live an average of 10 years longer than the American life expectancy of about 79 years. Butner whose work is part of the Blue Zones project, joined HuffPost Huff Live's uh, Caitlin Becker on Wednesday to explain what Seventh-day Adventists do right. That includes eating a plant-based diet and having a social network that reinforces the right behavior. Their religious beliefs are also a big help, he said.
they take this idea of Sabbath very seriously. So they're decompressing the stress, but Butner said. About 84% of healthcare dollars are spent because of bad food choices, inactivity, and unmanaged stress. And they have these cultural ways of managing stress through their Sabbath. The other thing we mentioned was water consumption. If you took a look at this graph here, you'll find that beef, if you were to uh, have a, um, a pound of beef, to produce a pound of beef takes 5,000 214 gallons of water. Pork, it's only 1,600 gallons. Chicken, cut that in half down to 815. An apple, 49. Potatoes, 24. Lettuce, 23. You can see a vegetarian diet reduces water consumption. Here's the next one. Calories of fossil fuel. You can measure oil, you can measure natural gas in calories. For a one calorie of nutrition from beef takes 54 calories of fossil fuels. Wheat is three, soybeans is two. So you can see there's a tremendous difference there in the consumption of fossil fuels. So the question you're asking, pastor, is veganism our message? Is this really what we're talking about? I mean, is, is that what we want to share with the world? No, that's not what we want to share with the world. Matthew 24, verse 14 is very clear. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. We are to share the good news that Jesus is coming again. That is our message. But you can get the message out in a way that will attract more people living a lifestyle from the Bible. There was an Adventist organic farmer over in Florida who lives a life based on the Bible. Here's an article about him. It says, Organic farmer Richard Kahn believes he's on a mission from God. We regard this as a health ministry, said Kahn, owner of Heart of Christmas Farms, an organic farm that produces hydroponic vegetables in East Orange County. Everything is natural and God-given. We call it God's diet plan. Khan is putting his faith as a Seventh-day Adventist, healthy body, healthy mind, healthy spirit, into practice by raising squash, beets, tomatoes, lettuce, herbs, and greens without chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, or soil. The whole Adventist church is living healthy, eating healthy. This is a ministry to provide healthy food to people and to keep them healthy, said Khan, 52, a lay pastor and professional computer programmer. Isaiah 1, 11, verse 19 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The more this world knows Jesus, the less they will kill. Not just human beings, but animals too. The knowledge of God will take away the need to take life. Second Chronicles does give us this message. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That is what God wants us to do. In this world, until Jesus comes, we have a responsibility to bring healing to this land. We want to do that for God's kingdom and to, bring, to reverse the curse that we find in the book of Genesis, the curse of sin in our lives. I love this one. This is a, a little advertisement from PETA, uh, the uh, uh, Society for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And uh, there they are. They said Jesus was a vegetarian. Big advertisement. Nope, Seventh-day Adventists had nothing to do with this one. I just thought that was pretty cool. The answer for this world is Jesus. And if people get to know Jesus, it will change their 
behavior. You know what? God wants us to change our behavior. But we cannot change people's behaviors by telling them what to do. You see, the answer is not what. The answer is who. The answer is Jesus. Our closing hymn will be number 214. We have this hope. Number 214. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much that our message is Jesus. But Jesus just isn't pie in the sky. He is good, healthy life here on this earth. And we ask, we pray that as we share Jesus, hearts will be touched and their lives will be changed. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.